you, you, you create this. You create this fictional character that you call. We, we cake for the kids. Frankie Smokes. No, it doesn't the exist. Kids. No, we call that it. Doesn't exist. What you are seeing doesn't exist. <laughs> he comes in and he just locks it down, and he, he the team plays better, and he he sits in the corner and just drills threes. What? No, he doesn't. He hates being in the corner. Ask him. He can't stand yeah. it. Why does he stand when his hand is on the hip when he's in the corner? Because he doesn't want to be there. Why? Both on his hand. Come on, guys. I, I love Nick fans. You guys take somebody who's like, you know, a, like whatever he is, and you turn him into something, some fictional superhero. What's going on? This is Jealous from Nick of Time Show. Here, giving you that Nick's talk just in the Nick of Time. And it's time to give you that Frank talk. I know Alan Hahn was, was cooking right there, but I'm going to tell you something, Alan Hahn. Frank Lakina. 93 percent Tyler corner threes, so he kind of does sit in the corner and hit threes. Like I know he was joking, but let's, let's need to hear it there. I got some guests here for you today. Give you that Knicks talk. First and foremost, it's my guy, Mister Faithful, the myth, the myth, the legend, the guy with the stats and the facts. Ryan G is in the building. Damn right, he's in the building. And also joining us. From Knicks at Night TV, my guy, D Trap. What's going on, man? What's up? What's up, yo? Thanks for having me, man. Let's get it. Let's get it going. Let's yeah, get let's this get, next talk. Let's, 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 let's get it going. Now, let me tell you something, guys. Let me tell you how this came about. So, shout out to CP, Knicks Fan TV. Me and CP, we, we did an interview with Alan Hahn. Definitely check that out on um, the Nick Time Show. YouTube.com slash Ticket Time Show, right? We did that interview with Alan Hahn, and D Trav, he came and he, and he hit me up in the DM. He's like, hey, man, I got some things I want to get off my chest. Something that Alan said, it really it struck me in my heart. He was speaking some facts about Frank, and I want to come on and talk about it. So here he is. Now, D Trav, let us know what. What what did Alan say that struck a chord with you that you you felt so so so, so passionate about that you just had to come on a show? <laughs> well, first off, um, good job on the interview you did with Alan Hahn and UNCP. Uh, but um, what he was saying, I just was waiting a long time for somebody to come out and say this on a show or in public because I totally agree with what he said. I feel as though. Um, the Frank Hive, as he was saying, uh, is, is uh, maybe, I don't want to say delusional. I don't want to sound disrespectful. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think they see uh, too much of a high ceiling for Frank. You know, I feel personally that um, Frank has showed us, he hasn't shown us anything I it's besides, you know, spots here and there that he could be a competent basketball player. Yes, he's a good defender. I wouldn't say elite yet because he hasn't had enough minutes in the NBA for you to call him an elite defender. He is a capable defender. He likes playing defense, but I wouldn't say he's an elite defender. Um, but uh, I would just say that, you know, Frank came from France. Uh, his first year, I re he came in the NBA. I know it was an adjustment period, but... When he was in France, he averaged four points a game. I mean, why did we think that he was going to come over here and be such a dominant factor in the NBA when his history has not said that? I know he's, a, I know he's still young. He still has potential development to do. But he didn't even start on his own team. Um, a kid by the name of Irv Walker that is well-known in New York City on the basketball circuits uh, – was playing on his team, and he was actually the starting point guard. Now, Earl Worker, don't get me wrong, he's a great basketball player, but he's not NBA ready. My point is, if Earl Walker cannot make it to the NBA, and he started over Frank Nilekina, why do we, and if Frank only averaged four points, why do we think Frank Nilekina is going to come over here and be the starting point guard for the New York Knicks? I'm just a little, I'm just a little confused on that theory there. But, um, and if you also think about the regime that drafted Frank was uh, Phil Jackson. And if you know Phil Jackson, he was stuck on running the triangle offense. And what he saw in Frank was Frank's potential to be a good defender, 
and be in the mold of like uh, Ron Hopper. You know, Ron Hopper used to be the point guard when you had Jordan and Scottie Pippen with the Trang offense. And he wasn't really a naturally point, a natural point guard. But all he, all he had to do was bring up the ball, initiate the Trang offense, sit in the corner. As you say, Jalen, Frank is good at sitting in the corner, 93 percentile hitting threes. That's, yeah. perfect for, that's perfect for the Trang offense. But guess what? We're not running the Trang offense anymore. So also, Alejan made the point that sometimes when Frank brings up the ball, he stops his dribble, and his teammates be looking at him like, come on, coach, what is this guy doing? He's messing up the offense, you know. So I just feel like he has to get adjusted to playing different positions if he wants to potentially start. But as a point guard, I don't think he has starting potential. I think he's a system player that could possibly do good on a team like the Spurs, where it's less uh, pressure on him. But even in the Spurs system, I don't think he will start for the Spurs. I think he may be a backup point guard. I just think his ceiling is a backup point guard, and we need to pump the brakes on the Frank Nilakina starting point guard for the New York Knicks. Go ahead. Ooh. Oh, there, 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 there was a lot of fire to unpack it. There. there was a lot of fire. There in the room, he stole all the air, bro. Like, word. <laughs> yeah, boy, there's a lot of fire to unpack. But um, I'll say this. I listened to the Alan Hahn interview, and Alan Hahn did make good points. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes Frank's dribble does stop, you know, near the logo. True. Which does mess up, you know, the floor of the offense. He is inconsistent. He hasn't he hasn't really put, oh, put together sugar games where it's like you can see, like, okay, you know, I know what I'm going to get from every night. You know, he does. And then again, to also um, to um, bring, bring up the fact about his Euro stats. Mm-hmm. The the thing with Frank with me, with me is like, if he could just develop a good jump shot and just learn that, okay, maybe I might not, you know, play the starting point. I might play point guard in spurts, but if I can just defend and then shoot the three, I feel like Frank could be at least a legit 3D guy in the NBA. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's just a matter of like, okay, is he going to start as a 3 and D guy on a team or is he going to come off the bench? I don't know. That's 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 how I feel about it. Yeah, yeah. First and foremost, too, we talk about these Europe lot, these Europe stats, right? These Euro League stats. Listen, young guards. We talked about this earlier. Young guards in the Euro League, young players in the Euro League. They they don't usually start, man. Their job is to go in there and back up the vets, get in the corner, get out the way, let the vets do their thing, and you wait your turn, son. It's like you getting it's like Thanksgiving you're at the, the kitty table. They ain't gonna let you, you know. They're not gonna let you whoopsie do down there over there unless you some special player like Luka Doncic or whatever, whatever, right? That's not that's just not what's going to happen. He played his role there, and especially in France, where they teaching you how to play system basketball. In France, we know that. So, uh, it, it, and second of all, second of all, I got heat right on the show because I wanted Frank to start, and people are confusing a couple of things. People think, oh, Jay Ellis thinks he Frank should start because you know he's the uh, he, he's a starting caliber point guard. No, not necessarily. If you remember, I was the one. Calling for Kira to be here. Why was I calling so hard for Kira to be here? Because I feel like when I'm looking at this roster, we're still, we still don't have the answer we need long term for a starting point guard. That's why I want Kira to be here. But now that I know we don't have him, we have Obi Top and thank you, Obi. I'm like, you know what? I'm looking at our options. I'm looking at Alfred Payton. Right. We know what he is. He is a point guard who passes really good to Julius Randle. And nobody else, <laughs> right? He plays decent defense, right? And if you're looking at his three-point percentage year after year for seven straight years, it has not moved. He had one semi-decent year where I thought, oh, maybe it's going gonna, it's gonna to go on up to And then it goes straight back down. So I already know what we have in Alfred Payton. When I'm looking at Franklin Lakina, I'm seeing his free throw percentage is, is ticking up every year. I'm seeing the corner three, 93rd percentile. I'm seeing he can play defense. And I'm also seeing that when RJ and him play together, RJ seems to like playing with him. Wonder why. Oh, probably why, because Frank Nikita actually passes him the ball. <laughs> and they both speak French. 
I'm not saying he's a starting power point guard per se. I'm not saying he's all star core Kyrie Irving, whoopsie do, break you down off the dribble. I already know he's not that. I know that he can be a combo guard. I know we have RJ Barrett here who can handle a lot of these 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 playmaking duties duties like he did in Duke. And I feel mm-hmm. like our best chance of getting a point guard here out of the young guys, anyway, not naming Mayo quickly. Or maybe Miles Rivers, who can shoot the three, is having Frank Lakina there, who we can develop and, and, and bring along. That's all I'm saying. What about the point that Alan Hunt made about uh, three different coaches saying uh, the same thing about Frank and um, about him not being able, being able to push the pace and slowing the ball down? I agree with him, but this is this is it. Here it is, right? We drafted this guy. Knowing he's going to be a project, I knew that. We saw that the jump shot was going to be there; it could take some time, but we knew offensively he's going to be a project, and that's exactly what he is. He's talking about Frank being inconsistent, but he—he he just turned twenty-one. Obi Toppin is older than Frank now, and Frank has been in the league longer, so it's like. Of course. What do you expect from a young guy but to be inconsistent? That's what young guys are. Unless you're special, when you get into the league, you do inconsistent stuff. So, yes, he should push the ball more. Yes, he should stop these little mistakes when he's stopping at half court. But also, he's had three coaches in three different years with no consistent role year to year, and you're and he's still young, and you're wondering why he's inconsistent. That's just what young players do. So okay. I'm just saying... Give this guy some time to grow. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's going to be the Knicks because of the glut at point guard once again. There's no clear path for anybody, including DSJ, who Knicks fans kind of boot off. Because right. you remember that, you, that we won Frank Drinks, and not to say that we were trying to boot DSJ off off the the floor, but come on, we, we remember that, like. Well, maybe one of the reasons why Frank cannot push the ball is because he don't want to go too hard when he pull his grind, you know. He usually, <laughs> <laughs> he usually has that problem. And I just want to oh, know... <laughs> and I just want to know, how come y'all have all this patience for Frank, but you don't keep the same energy for Kevin Knox? When Kevin Knox first came to the Knicks, Brian. John, 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 <laughs> John Calipari warned, warned you guys it's going to take three to four years for this kid to develop. But in three to four years, he is going to be the best person that came out of that draft. We knew what he was going to be a project. Just like you guys said, Frank is going to be a project. I don't understand how come if there's a Frank hive, why there's not a Kevin Knox hive? Because at the end of the day, I know people like to say, well, Frank has a special skill, which is defense, and maybe he has a good form, so he could become exactly, a good exactly exactly what it is. He's, <laughs> he's just a definable <laughs> skill. When you yeah. look at Frank, go, what is he good at? He's good at defense. Cool. All right. Kevin when you look Knox. at Kevin Knox, what is he good at? Shooting. He's a sh- he's a good shooter. Does it does uh, the number support uh, that? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, Frank's numbers doesn't support that either. I'm saying it. It's mean, a portion from the free throw line. It's a portion <laughs> from the corner three. But I think, oh, well, what Kevin Knox is, what happened was he came in as a rookie. He killed in summer league. Everybody thought, oh, my God, he's dunking on everybody. He's hitting step back threes. He's doing this and that. He's going to be a superstar now. He's the savior of the Knicks. I can't wait till Kevin Knox start playing. And then once he got into the season, he didn't start doing that. Everybody just fell off the Kevin Knox train. Like, here we go again. Another Knicks failure. Another Knicks bust. But – like I said, if you look at how they used them in Kentucky as far as running them off screens and um, things like that, if the Knicks would use them more like that and get Kevin Knox some open shots, and he's also not bad at handling the ball. Kevin Knox is actually a decent ball handler. If you, why don't you look up the percentile of him with pick and rolls with Mitchell Robinson and how many alleys he's throwing at Mitchell Robinson, and they connect right on that. And he also is good as a pick and roll because when Mitchell Robinson's the pick, he could hit open threes. So I'm just saying, give give them a chance. Give them a chance. You want to get Ronnie, you want to say something? I feel like you want to jump in. <laughs> jump into and then be back and forth with me. But I feel like you want to get in. Go ahead if you want to get in. Well, 
I would I would love to look up that stat about Kevin Knox um and Mitchell Robinson in the pick and roll and his percentile, whatever the case may be. But I'm thinking that it might be a bit skewed because I'm not sure how many opportunities he had last season to do that. So <laughs> right. because of his like a playing time. So <laughs> I, I just gotta put that out there. But um here's my thing with Kevin Knox. Like, this is why I give Frank a chance and I'm kind of down on Kevin Knox right now because even though Frank is not consistent. There was at least games last season where I saw him play, and I was like, okay, there's something there. It might not be a lot, but something is there. I don't know what was wrong with Kevin Knox last season. Like, beginning of the season, I understand he had to play back up to Marcus Morris because Marcus Morris was here. And you could you could argue that because, Mar- because Marcus Morris was balling. So it's like, well, you're going to put Kevin Knox in the- ahead of Marcus Morris now, so he had to come off the bench. I think I think what's an what's an indictment against Kevin Knox was the fact that when Marcus Morris left, he didn't get the playing time when you know when you know that's supposed mm-hmm. to be you know minutes open up. Kevin Knox is supposed to be your guy in there, but instead they were playing other guys like what Reggie Bullock and Wayne Ellington, all these other dudes that you know these dudes are not going to be with the Knicks long term. But Kevin Knox is Kevin Knox is the next pick. I just think the problem was Coach Mike Miller was coaching for his job, and he he was too scared to put Kevin Knox. He rather went, went with the vets because he wanted to win games. Mm-hmm. I think that was part of it, but yeah, I also think be. part of it was Kevin Knox was Kevin Knoxon. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yo, I'm just so confused. Though you guys really get on Kevin Knox, it's got to be fair treatment. If you're gonna no, get on Kevin is. Knox, you got to get it on the same way. Let me tell you, okay. I sat, sat here and said, I just sat here and said, if Frank Lakina is not pushing the pace like he's supposed to, I get it. Take him out. Da, da, da. Okay. See, we see what he's doing. Do that. And they was doing right. that. Frank Lakina was playing better under Mike Miller because I feel like his role was more defined under Mike. Now, there were certain times where I felt like he should have played a little bit more because mm-hmm. I felt like when he was having a good game, he took him out. And he was like, 15 minutes, that's it. Boom. <laughs> like, right. no matter what, good game or bad, he just took him out. Except mm-hmm. for that that 20-point, 10 assist game that he had. Right? But I, I I just feel like Kevin Knox, he lost his confidence. He straight up lost his confidence. Uh, the NBA took the heart out of him. I was actually listening to Alan Hahn on another show. I can't remember what show that was. It might have been Pie Street one. But I was listening to Alan Hahn on another show. And he was talking about the NBA players were picking on Kevin Knox on the defensive end. It was like barbecue chicken. Whatever he got on the floor, <laughs> everybody was targeting Kevin Knox. And because that happened, he lost his confidence and everything else just fell apart. Right. Uh, well, I feel like, you know, Kenny Payne is here. So he has a familiar face, which should make him feel more comfortable and help with his development. So I think he should take, you know, bigger steps this year in, in his player development, and you're going to see a different Kevin Knox this year. Also about the defending thing, um, I feel Kevin Knox, yes. I mean, I play basketball too. So I, sometimes you could be a good defender, but you may get a little nervous, like you said, if people's pick on you. Like, there's been times I've been on the playground. I know for a fact I'm a good defender. Maybe the offensive player don't know. They'd be like, clear it out. I got him. I got him. And I'd be looking like, what? And then he do it one play. Hey, then man, do I'm two play. seven. I be getting that all the time. And then when I stop <laughs> them, they get mad. Right. And they try to make you. I'm like, that phantom foul, bro. Man, you some push-ups, man. Get out of my face. <laughs> but, but I definitely understand what you're saying. But if you look at his length, right? If you look at his agility as far as Kevin Knox, he has the potential yeah. to be a good. He has the potential to he be a good defender. He doesn't know how to use his body, right? First, the first thing in, in being a good defender is just be a solid defender. You don't gamble. Just learn how to use your lane. Put your hands up on contest shots. Mm-hmm. Stay in, stay in front of the, the ball handler. And those that once you angles mm-hmm. and once you learn that, once you learn the basics of defense, then as you go on, then you start learning the tricks of the trade and what you can do to be a lockdown defender. I think he has to learn that first to not get lost on defense. Sometimes, you know, these guys are young, man. They just finished playing Fortnite. You know, you got quickly. These, you got these, guys, <laughs> <laughs> these guys got to get, you know, they mind right and mature as a man and, and you know, and, and understanding that this is a job. This is what's going to pay my bills. I, I want to win and I got to take this more serious. I think his father, you know, being a former NFL player and, and Kenny Payne being here now, shit, it's, would really, really help him out. And um, 
Hopefully the same thing happened with Frank because we got the Utah uh, assistant coach, right? He's supposed to be the point guard whisperer, right? Yeah, yeah Johnny Bryan. Mm-hmm. Johnny Bryan. So maybe, who knows, maybe two or three players on the Knicks take a big leap this year and um, we all be happy because as Knicks fans, we all want the, the players to do good and help us win. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you, you know, like, okay, I get on Kevin Knox a lot, but of course I want to see Kevin Knox improve because I'm like, if Kevin Knox improves and shows his potential... That helps the Knicks in general. I'm a Knicks fan. You know right, what I mean? Right. Like, don't like the only reason I really get on Knox was because you know that second season I didn't really I didn't really see anything from him. You know, and then like the fact that like he struggles on defense, and then even offensively, it seemed like you know the fact that he struggles on defense it affected his confidence offensively. Then it's like okay, if he's not con- if he's not confident on either side of the floor, you know what's the use of him? But you know, like like you said, you know, Kenny Payne is here, you know, from, you know, Kentucky. He's familiar with Knox, so you're hoping that he can improve Knox. So Knox can become a competent basketball player. And, you know, and, and you just hope that these young dudes can develop, you know, and things like that. But I do have one beef to pick, though. Okay. And and it's and it's something I've mentioned on, you know, on podcasts before. Or, you know, or, or on the Knicks show before. I'm tired of the Knicks picking up trash from Kentucky. I'm sorry. We have quickly. We've been through this, man. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Like quickly, I'm quickly. He know he quickly looks like he's going to be a good player. So I'm happy about that. I'm talking about before quickly. You know, like we pick up Julius Randle. Like I said, Julius Randle is a good player. <laughs> Julius Randle is a good player, but I don't know if he's a match with the Knicks. Kevin Knox hasn't shown me anything so far. We pick up Michael Kidd Grid. Uh, we pick we pick up Michael Kidd Gill Chris. Whose man is this? Whose man is this? Like, right. you might not make right. a t- uh, uh, huh? He might not make a team. I don't well, maybe he will because he, he's a CAA guy and Tom likes defense. But we already have a, a, a guy who can guard multiple positions here. Yeah, right, I know. And, and then and then we got Noel here. No Noel is Noel. I like Noel. He's a good Don't play. get me He's wrong. A good play. He's he, a good play. You know, but the man's is a backup, you know, sense. Let's be real Yo, about stop it. Saying that like it's a <laughs> slight. He's nice. <laughs> No, he you know he's a good player. I'm just saying he's a backup center. I, I'm like, yo, if we're gonna bring in guys from Kentucky, why could it never be a Jamal Murray? Why could it never be a Devin Booker or somebody like that? Like I'm like I I'm just that's all I'm that's all I want to say. That's, but, that's but, all. but who knows? But, all. Who knows if Jamal Murray would be Jamal Murray if he was drafted by the Knicks? That, yeah, that is true though. That is true. Yeah, they were just buried him on true. the bench. <laughs> And give him three different coaches and say he's not developing fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, uh, but, but speaking of trading, trading ahead. point guards, we still mm-hmm. haven't really talked about uh, another elephant in the room, right? Your boy, your boy DSA, man. Okay, Dennis Smith Jr. Yes, right. your boy DSA, right. because I know you was getting out with the Frank stuff. You, you were getting at you want DSJ to start, right? Uh, do I want DSJ to start? Um, honestly, I like DSJ, but I'm more of a fan of RJ being the next star in the NBA. So I'm for the point guard that's going to help RJ, you know, show all the skills that, that he possessed on the court. That's why I wasn't a big fan of Marcus Morris or a big fan of Julius Randle bringing up the ball or Alfred Payton passing okay. the ball consistently to um, Julius Randle. So, yes. I think DSJ has the it factor as far as explosiveness and athleticism, as far as what you would want in your starting point guard, because he will put constant pressure on the opposing point guard. When you go against guys like Kyrie Irving and guys like Kimba Walker, I understand, yes, um, Frank is a good defender, but you also need to put pressure on those point guards by attacking them, getting them in a foul trouble. I don't think Frank is the person who's going to get those point guards into foul trouble and put them on the bench. I feel the way that DSJ attacks the rim, you have no choice but to either foul him or get out or get out the way. Like, he's very aggressive. And if you could, if the coaches on the Knicks could tap into that potential, then I know his jump shot is broken, but you know he's been working with, uh, <laughs> you know yeah. he's been working with. We know. Uh, we know. You know <laughs> Abdul Rao. Oh, yes. You know who he's been working with, right? 
before that, he was working with another another guy. Key Who smart. was he working with? Key, Key Smart. <laughs> Key really shut down. Right. And in Dallas, he was also working his jump shot, and it didn't work then either. But continue. But, but, then, but yeah, it's, he doesn't it's only have been to, three seasons to be fair. There's only been three seasons to be fair. <laughs> he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to be a knockdown three point shooter. At least thirty three percent, thirty four percent is decent enough. You know, you make it up in other areas like. Uh, his, and I think he also gets knocked on for his defense, which is not fair because he sometimes he does get a lot of steals in games. Didn't he have a seven steal game with the Knicks last year? He may I'll not be a lot. Yeah, I think he has a. I, <laughs> was that was, it, was I, that Alfred Payton? <laughs> I don't remember. No, that. I think I think De- Dennis Smith Jr. had a seven steal game also with the with the Knicks. Yeah, also, gotcha. if I be, you gotta, yeah, yeah, we, gotta, we, gotta, yeah, we gotta check that out. Yeah, if if if, if it wasn't last season, I think it was probably like when he first came, but. Yeah, yeah, right. I think it maybe it was against the cat. Was it against the Cavaliers? I believe it was. I believe it was against the Cavaliers. He had seven steals that game. Well, I but anyway. that happened. But anyway. So <laughs> he may not be a lockdown defender like Frank, but he may be a passing lane defender like Allen Iverson. You know, there's different ways to play defense other than shutting your man and shutting your man down. Absolutely, I mean, man. So go I ahead. <laughs> No, I get it. I get it. I get why people want him to start. He has the most potential out of any part guard on this team, and that's why they want him to start. They see the athleticism. They see you have Johnny Bryant here, and they go, why not Dennis? And I'm just like, I don't know if he has the heart to be that guy. It just seems like wherever he goes, if there's a little bit of – turmoil or everything is not exactly the way he wants it to be he gets upset and he checks out i feel like he checked out in dallas i feel like he was checking out here now of course you know he was going through his he's going through his things like he went through a lot of uh, trepidation this year and i get that but it's like it's weird because he'll go he'll he'll go through his thing and then he'll play dallas right because remember the Knicks dallas game and he'll mm-hmm. wait for a game and you're like Oh, okay. Well, there's something here. And then he checks out for the next 28 games. And you're like, what's happening? He doesn't want to be here. And that's the sense I get from it. He doesn't want to be here. And when Fizdale left, because that was his man, I felt like he got hurt. When Key Smart left, that was somebody's corner. He got hurt. Steve Mills came to him after the bad, in the middle of the bad season and says, hey, you know what? I know you want to get out of here. I'm going to trade you. Steve Miz leaves. So to, to me, he doesn't want to be here. And I know he doesn't want to be here. So me starting Dennis Miz Jr. over Frank, knowing Frank wants to be here, <laughs> and DHA doesn't, to me, it's just like, it just feels weird. Especially because I, I still remember the, the, the We Want Frank chance where I felt like they just thrust DSJ into the game knowing he wasn't playing well, knowing that Frank was playing better than he was at that time, at that point in time, and they still pushed him in front of Frank. And that irritated the hell out of me because I felt like he didn't earn anything. And even when he was messing up, he got those four turnovers in four minutes. They were still trying to keep him out there and let it go. And it was just like, like, what's happening right now? Like, is your heart in it? It's not. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I I want people here who want to be here. Right. Yeah, I mean, I feel Jay on that. Um, I think my my main concern with DSJ is the fact that like, it's it's basically what Jay said. Like, when he was in Dallas that first season, he had no competition. The point guard position was his, and that's when he performed his best. You know, like quote unquote when the conditions were right. But then next year, when they drafted Luka Doncic, now and now he, and now he had competition at that point guard spot. It felt like he was, you know, kind of he had an attitude. You know, he was checking out or whatever the case may be. They moved him to New York. Okay, that first half of the season when he was here, he performed well. And then that was the season when Frank had a down year. And people were thinking that Frank was going to be gone and DSJ was possibly going to stay. But it ended up not happening like that. Now, the following season after that now, DSJ had competition again at the point guard spot because even though he was going through a lot, he had, he had Frank that was still competing with him for the position. He had Alfred Payton that he had to deal with. And I felt like, again, he kind of just checked out, despite that, you know, he had, a, he had a lot going that season, going on that season in his personal life. And my thing right. is, like, 
okay, if if every time you run into a situation where you're competing with other players for a position and you just tend to check out or you just you just don't seem interested in whatever the case may be, that's gonna make me that's gonna make me, make me start questioning your competitive spirit as a player. Cause I'm like you're, you're supposed to thrive on that. Like, yo, you're an NBA player. You're supposed to thrive yeah. on competition and things and things like that. So and I've heard that same complaint in college, and I know his college team wasn't built correctly, and he had some 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 drama with his coach. But I've heard mm-hmm. the same criticism of him in college where he was checking out. So I was just like, well, well, personally, I think with Dennis Smith Jr. is like you know, besides the player aspect of it, like as he is as a person. I think he may be the type of person that doesn't respond well to like a lot of criticism or maybe coaches being hard on him. He more so like a guy he likes coaches exactly. to encourage, encourage him. And like and now we have Tom Thibodeau who eats plays a lot. So <laughs> you, you know um, Woody Woody is going to have to like be his best friend because Woody right. is the guy who's going to inject some confidence in you and maybe Johnny Bryan as well. I'm sorry, continue. <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I just think maybe him as a person, he's he's had the keys handed to him since he was in high school. He was a high school star sensation. I forgot if he was like the number one, the number two point guard in his draft class when he was coming out of high school, if he was mm-hmm. considered that. So he went, he decided to go to North Carolina State. I don't know why. Maybe because he felt like he would get the most minutes there. So like you said, he's used to getting things handed to him and he's used to people boosting him up and that gives him confidence on the court. Like he feels like, you know, you have your swag. Hey, yo, I'm the man. Nobody can mess with me. But as soon as somebody said like, nah, I think he may be a little bit better than you. Like we're going to try to see what's going on. Like he's like, yo, man, what's going on? So yeah. that, so I think maybe that's that's what it is with him. Yeah. And you know what? I don't know what type of focus he's going to have this season. You know, he's been working on his jump shot again. He On his media day, uh, the Knicks, you know, they stuck him out there because I feel like, I think Mark Berman said it in an interview, they're going to try to raise his trade value. That's why they have him out there as the first guard to talk. You know? <laughs> but uh, he seems focused right now. He he talked about how he 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 seems like he's trying to grow as a man and and learn from mistakes and 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 power through his, his uh, trepidations and stuff. But hopefully hopefully it all works out for him. Because you know what? After all my harsh criticisms, anybody wearing a blue and orange jersey, I'm rocking with. So I'm going to rock with DSJ. I'm going to rock with Frank. I'm going to rock with Knox. I'm going to rock with anybody in a uniform. Even right. though I'm, I'm not 100% confident in everything, if he wins, we win. And even if he's trying to win because he wants to leave, because I feel like that's what he wants to do, we we at least we get something in return, and if he wants to stay, then hopefully he keeps going in that direction. And, right, and, and you know what? What's what, what's what's phase? What's phase? What's phase? Because we're talking about these young guys, right? Mm-hmm. And there's another young guy I want to talk about, our beloved Mitch Robinson, who, who's been in the news recently because of certain criticisms, right? So. Here's what I've read um, recently from St- Stephen Bondi. And you know, Stephen Bondi, um, not even just Stephen Bondi, some other players, some other reporters as well, because, you know, Stephen Bondi has that reputation of being a Knicks hater, but other reporters and reporters as well. Jeff Van Gundy, who's extremely close to Tom Thibodeau, was the head coach of the 2019 USA Select Team, Mitch Robinson reportedly left a poor impression on USA coaches and staff as he eventually left camp that year, citing a knee injury. Um, <clears throat> now, there's been questions about his commitment, specifically regarding Robinson's experience with the Team USA in camp in 2019. Robinson arrived late. <clears throat> there was all kinds of problems getting him to Vegas, a Team USA, a team USA source said, and he left an poor impression on coaches' staff, according to sources. Um, also, you know what, too? Um... I'm going to play something really quick. All right. A short little review of what Tom Thibodeau thinks about Mitchell Robinson when asked about on medium day. Okay. Allison, who's starting to scratch the surface right now. And does, does he remind you of anybody when you see him out on the floor? No, I, I mean, I think he's had some good, really good moments. Um, but 
but I think he's, you know, he's got a long way to go. I think the, the work part, the professionalism to continue to grow, to impact winning, uh, there's a lot of room for, for growth. And, um, I think the discipline to, uh, to practice well each and every day, uh, I'm excited about having him here. Uh, where we can get to work with him each and every day. And I, I don't know where he'll end up. And I hate to compare him to anyone because there's things that he can do that are very unique. And I think we were very fortunate to get Nerlens Noel. I think he's in some ways very similar. Uh, when you look at rim protection and where uh, Nerlens uh, ranked last year, I believe he was second in the league. And I also believe he was in the top five in finishing. So we're excited about both guys. Okay, that was Tom Thibodeau. And I'll say this about this statement. The thing that stood uh, stood out about me with that statement, right, was Tom Thibodeau pointed out that Mitchell Robinson has to get better with his, pro- his practice habits. <clears throat> so when I'm reading that from Stephen Bondi and I'm seeing that from Tom Thibodeau, in my mind, I'm like, okay, there's something has to be there that's true. You know, and I've also read in other places that you know Mitch is a good kid. He's not like a complete, you know, waste of space, and he he's not like a guy who's like super lazy or whatever, whatever. But he's still a kid, and he has to tighten up his practice habits. And a guy like Tom Thibodeau is not going to let that slide, especially when we have a guy like Nerlens Noel there, which is also interesting because when asked about Mitchell Robinson. He was like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's exciting. But Nerves Noel's here too. And it was like, oh. <laughs> I, 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 I just think uh, what Coach Tibbs is, is really coaching to win this year. So mm-hmm. as we were saying with DSJ, uh, he's not going to sit there and let DSJ turn over the ball four times. He's coming out the game. Same thing with Mitchell Robinson. If Mitchell Robinson is out there fouling people or not playing hard and not setting screens the correct way, He's gonna have to pull pull him out the game and put Noel in the game because mm-hmm. he he want he he wants to win. So he, I think he's gonna have a very short lease with his players this year. And that's not a knock on Mitchell Robinson. That's just Coach Tibbs and the way he's gonna coach. But as far as practicing habits go, um, you know, in college he really didn't play on the team. He ba- he basically stopped playing because his coach left right, and he just started training for the NBA draft. Right. So maybe he didn't pick up those practice habits that he was supposed to pick up in college. And then you come to the NBA and, you know, you go to a terrible team like the Knicks. You know, usually bad teams don't usually have good practice habits. So maybe they just picking on the kids, you know. What you what you think, Ryan? Um, With Mitch, well, first, first and foremost, I want to mention this. I'm still waiting for the next episode of Mitch's Block Party, first and foremost. <laughs> still, waiting, still waiting for that episode. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um... Okay, here's my thing with Mitch. You know, you never heard about Noel having bad practice habits or bad work ethic or whatever the case may be. And I feel like if you have somebody here to legit challenge Mitch for his position, you know, for a starting position at center, I feel like if Mitch really wants it that bad enough, Mm -hmm. he's going to pick up those, he's going to, you know, change those bad practice habits and, you know, and look at what Noel does and be like, okay, you know what? This is what I have to do if I'm going to hold on a starting center position for the Knicks or for any NBA team in general. So I feel like them bringing in Noel is a, a definitely a positive. And if Mitch is not careful, Noel will take his position and Noel will be the one when Noel will be the starting center while Mitch is going to have to come off the bench again. Oh, Noel wants it. Noel wants it. Right. Noel wants yeah. to start. He, he talked about that in his in his media interview. He's going for well, it. You, yeah, well, you brought up – you just reminded me you brought up a good uh, point was uh, – the fact that uh, him being challenged in practice. So that what made it seem like when uh, DeAndre Jordan first came, it seemed like DeAndre Jordan took him under the wing yep. and he was teaching and he was teaching Mitch. And then once DeAndre Jordan left, if you look at Mitch's um, interview, uh, he made it seem like, you know, dudes can't guard him in practice because they're smaller than him, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he made it seem like, oh, I'm glad Noel's here because finally somebody can actually challenge me and contest my shots. And they was just like, who are you talking about, Tom Gibson? He was like, no. No. <laughs> case, no. Yes, you was. I'm talking about Tosh. Tosh can't right. call me. Shout out to Tosh. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead, Jay. Jay. 
No, I, 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 I totally agree with you, man. I think it, it's interesting because I know everybody has Mitch slated as their starting five. But then mm-hmm. when you look at these statements and you see what Noel can do, like, of course, Mitch has the higher ceiling because, you know, he, he, he had, like, you know, second year, the best, best field goal percentage in the NBA. There's nothing to sneeze at, you know, breaking block, block records already. Mm-hmm. Uh, offensively. It just seems like he's more willing to try to expand his game, even though he hasn't really used it in the game. So he has a higher upside, but I don't know. It might he might not start right away. He might right. not. He might not. That's something to look look out for. I know some people might think that you know Thomas is a, a scare tactic mm-hmm. to motivate him, which could possibly be it. But me, I also personally- some truth to it. Yeah, but, but me personally, and that's I want to see uh, Mitch develop. But like I said, I'm, I'm for what helps the Knicks win. And at the end of the day, I think, well, I think they will just split the minutes. Personally, I think that's a good two-headed monster to have. Like both of them are similar. Both of you pick and roll, go for the alley. Um, they could switch on to uh, switch on, on, on when, during the pick and roll and be able to stand for the point guard, shooting guards. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Noel. So I, I personally like Noel too. I, I see he hustles right. a lot. So to me, yeah, Noel has just like like Mitch does. So, <laughs> <laughs> so to me, like either way, like both of them between both of them, you got what ten fouls? So, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then so, here we go, Amari Spell. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, with the spell. Hit the three spell. I know you're gonna shoot it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's one thing, Mitch. I mean, but actually, if you look at No, he already has that. He does have a mid range jump shot. He does, you know. Yeah, shoot he comes out a little more. Yeah, more than a Mitchell Robinson. Robinson. So if Mitchell Robinson is going to want to stay on the floor, he, maybe he might have to unleash that three this year that he always shows to us in um, practice or whatever, yeah. his little one, one-on-one with his 5 foot 11 homeboys. Yeah, yeah, it's time. <laughs> it's time. I, I will say this, though. I'm wondering what the plan is for Mitch long-term because he, he changed his agent again, mm-hmm. right? Uh it was weird because it seemed like the Knicks were interested in Weissman. I heard rumors about it. Oh, Weissman, then, uh, Weissman, okay. Yeah, CP and Allen, they were kind of like, nah, that was real. That was a real thing. I didn't take it too seriously. But they right. were talking about trading up and having Mitch be involved. Now, he wasn't involved. Like, it didn't happen. You know, it came out that they didn't want to move these, p- these pieces, RJ and Mitch. Mm-hmm. But you have to also wonder why... You know, there's no, there has been no qualifying offer extended to Mitch as of yet. Right. You know, uh, of course he's eligible right now, but nothing's been been offered. So, I think uh, maybe the Knicks are just looking like this year is the year they're going to decide Frank and DSJ, Mitchell Robertson. Right. Can't show us what you got this year because uh, it's not guaranteed you're going to be back with us. So. This is your last chance to show us what you got. Mm-hmm. You see, they yeah, got Alonzo Trail yeah. up out of there with the quickness. They got Danny oh, Dotson the out, uh, exactly. Dotson out there with the quickness, so they're exactly. not playing games. Yeah. And also, um, I just want to point out one thing too. Like, I think the reason why they're doing that as well is because you have to remember this is a new regime in New York right now. Like, you have Leon Rose. Like, it's basically a whole new front office. Like, the only guy that's here is probably Scott Perry from the pre- the previous regime, and. What's always the case with, like, a new regime in place is, you know, these young guys were not drafted under this new regime. So they're not going to just automatically be like, unless he's a special player, they're not just going to automatically be like, well, you know, this young player's been here for a while, you know, we're going to extend him or whatever the case may be. It's going to it's gonna have to be a case of, you know what, you're going to have to prove it that you, mm-hmm. de- you, you deserve to stay here. And I feel like the approach Tom Thibodeau has taken is the right approach. I, like, I was always a guy that always believed that if you want young players to develop, you have to play them a lot. You can't just have them on the bench, you know, s- sitting there and watching the game and expect that they're going to get better. But at the same time, I'm like, these guys now, they've been in the league two years, three years, four years, whatever the case may be. And it's like, it's about time they get challenged. It's like, yeah. all right, you know, pressure bust pipes. There is a balance. You, you, you know, so now you know that when the season starts now, if any of the young guys are starting, you know that they definitely earned that. You know what right. I'm saying? As opposed, to, as, as opposed to it being like, okay, you know, these are the young guys. We got to develop them. So, you know what? We're just going to hand them starting positions and just see how they do. Exactly. You know what? Oh, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say, he, uh, you know, well, uh, to uh, hit on another point that Ryan was saying, is just like, yes, we want them to play. Uh, yes, we all, as Knicks fans, we want to see one of them develop. We got how many now? We got Mitchell Robinson, we got R.J. Barrett, we got Kevin Knox, we got uh, Frank, we got DSJ. These are all young players, right? We want to see at least two, two of them hit. Oh, mm-hmm. first, we got Obi Toppin. At least two or three. Two or three of them hit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we got two or three yeah. of them hit. So we want them to play. But at the end of the day, we can't just throw you out there just to say to throw you out there and just keep losing. Show us in practice. Show us in practice that you deserve to play. You can't look terrible in practice and I'm going to just say, oh, I'm just going to play Kevin Knox because he was drafted number eight. I got to play him when he wasn't doing anything in practice. Exactly. So your time to shine is in practice. Pay attention to detail in practice. Hit your shots in practice. Compete against everybody. Show that you're the best person in practice. So when game time comes and the coach looked down the bench, he remembers, yo, Kevin Knox. Yes, he was killing in practice. Let's see what he's going to do in the game. It's a balance, though, too, right? It's definitely it's, it's a balance because, and I mentioned this on the show before, Jeff T was playing out there for Tom Thibodeau a while ago, and he's complaining that he was getting run down to the ground. He was sitting there like, coach, this other guy is going to play. Put, put them in. I'm tired. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's one thing to play the vets and the, the guys who earned the minutes, but it's another thing to give DNPs. You know, right, I, right. I understand. I understand that Kevin Knox has to, uh, you know, bring people around slow, and he's not ready. But ten minutes a game, give him something, something, something to be like. Oh, get some bone? game action in. Get some game action. Yes, show practice. Yes, but also it's going to be different this year too because. You know what? This Knicks team, they're a proponent of the G League. Tom Thibodeau said, hey, we will put players in the G League, no problem. But this year, the G League is is kind of fuzzy. You know, the COVID thing happening. They're talking mm-hmm. about having a G League bubble. But how how active is that bubble going to be? It's not going to be as simple as seasons ago. Like a few seasons ago, you know, Luke Cornette could go play in the G League take the train, come back to New York and then play in the game. Like, it's not going to be like that anymore. So, we're going to have to be even more deliberate on how we divide up these G League minutes, these bench minutes, these starter minutes. It's going to be a balance. And I hope Tom Thibodeau has learned from the past. In his interviews, he pretty much said that you know, you have to keep what you kill. (laughs) They fish that stuff. (laughs) (laughs) But hopefully he doesn't go overboard. The Knicks... Still have eighteen million dollars in cap space left. <laughs> so at this point, I'm still looking around like, what are we gonna wait for? Like, what are we using it on? Eighteen million in cap space. Mm. I don't know. I'm you looking at Buddy to... Hill. Uh huh. Yep. I'm looking at I'm looking at uh, Victor Oladipo. I'm not saying to get him. Oh, but okay. I'm saying he's going to be on the radar. I can definitely see him on the radar. And um, Zach Levine as well, man. I, like I can see Zach Levine. Levine being a target as well. Because as you know, the Knicks are, tar- are going to try to target disgruntled stars mm-hmm. to get them on the squad. Have the Bulls really done anything to get anybody else on his team this year? No, not really. I, I can see Oops. Zach Levine being a target. I can see the Knicks and Scott Perry still trying to get Victor Oladipo if, if he um if plays he performs. Well. Hmm? No, well, well, the only problem with Zach Levine is that didn't Thibodeau had him and then he wanted Jimmy Butler, so he got rid of him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I don't I don't I'm not sure about the Zach Levine, but um as far as what they're gonna do, I have no clue what the Knicks are gonna do. I, with with the 18 million, can they just leave it until the trade deadline? Like, do they have to spend it right now? No, no, they, they don't. don't have to. They don't. Okay. No, they don't even have to. Like as of now, they're ten percent under the cap floor, right? And if they and if they don't, I don't remember exactly what the deadline is, deadline is to reach the cap floor. But if they do not reach the cap floor, what happens is the money will be dispersed throughout the players on the team to mm-hmm. reach that cap floor. So it's like, hey man, instead of getting the six million. Uh, this season, you get some extra, you get 6.5 or a 7, and it'll be spring. So it's like, there's no real 
L for the Knicks if they don't spend that money to get to the cap floor. They're gonna just keep they're gonna keep their options open and wait and see what happens. Right. So do you guys have any preference? Yeah, are your guys team Buddy Hill, team Victor Oladipo, team mm-hmm. Zach Levine? Any guys? Um, I mean, not any players at the moment that are that are disgruntled or maybe disgruntled. Like Buddy Hill, like I said, he's a good player. You know, he can shoot the three really well, and shooting is definitely a priority in today's NBA. But I mean, I'm not pressed to go after Buddy Hill. The same goes for um Zach Levine. I'm not really pressed to go after Zach Levine as well. Even though Zach Levine, he's proven that he can definitely score the rock this see you know, this past season and things like that. But I don't see any of those players necessarily as like a franchise changing player where I'm going to really, you know, open up my cap space for those players. You know, I, I like I feel like all those players are like complementary pieces where it's like, I right, you know, you could put them, you know, you could put them next to like a guy that's like the real number one on a team and then your team is going to be really good and might be championship competitive. But as for guys that like, I feel like, you know, if they come, they're going to change the fortune of the Knicks. I don't see that, but I don't know. Here's, here's my thing. Uh, I've won. You know what? I was on the fence about Buddy Hill last time, Ryan. And I think I'm leaning towards it, yo, depending on the, the price, right? Because, Right now, we still have Julius Randle. I know there was a crazy rumor going around that the Knicks were um, were shopping Frank Lakina. There was this whole thing where, you know, Knicks Twitter page, they posted pictures of Frank Lakina. All of a sudden, they took it down. Everybody thought he was being traded. You look at his bio. There was no Knicks or anything in his bio. So everybody was like, oh, that confirms that he's being traded. Come to find out. He's still here. He took he took down the the bio like in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing imminent, but he's still here. But there was this crazy rumor that maybe it could be like a Julius Randle, Frank, and a pick, or I don't know what or whatever picks for Buddy Hill. And I thought about it. I was like, that actually might make sense. I, yeah, I think I think you guys just want to get Julius Randle out here so out here so bad. But so I know, Bo- go ahead. Okay. No, I was gonna say I know Buddy Hill is a good player, but like Ryan was stating, and like these guys that we're aiming for is not gonna take us over the top. Why give Buddy Hill a chance when you could just plug quickly? And I feel like quickly could probably do the same things that Buddy Hill could do. So what is the point of even trading okay. for Buddy Hill? Well, I'll break this down. Right, <laughs> think about it, because. The number one concern was right the money, right? Mm-hmm. Buddy Hill is making what twenty? What is it? Twenty four million or something right now per year? If you look at mm-hmm. his contract, but the thing is, the contract the sense oh. is not is not just straight. Okay, I'm pulling up the contract right now. Twenty four million twenty one twenty the twenty 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 one the twenty 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 one twenty one year. The following year. It's 19 million. The following year after that, I mean, the following year is 18 million. Then it goes to 18 million again. So it's like, there's a few of those years where it's 18 million. Then it goes back up to 20. So the contract really isn't as bad as you originally thought it was. Right. Also, we were also talking about Julius Randle. And his role, right? How do they fit together with Obi Toppin? Is it re- is it feasible to play Julius Randle and Obi, Pop- Obi Toppin together in the starting lineup? Well, we already said that Obi Toppin cannot play small forward. So that means Julius or him will have to play center in, in spurts. And, right. Um, so I don't think it's feasible to play them unless you're going to play a small ball lineup. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So it's like, all right, you already you already know long term it's probably not in our best interest to have both of those guys on this on the team at the same time. Right. So in in that and then you have a guy who who at one point was uh one of the best three point shooters in the league. He took a dip last season, but I feel like they can go back up pretty quickly. 
Right, right, but I just right. feel like why are we trying to trade Julius Randle for a shooting guard? Shouldn't we be trying to trade him for a point guard? Like instead of Buddy Hill, what about the point guards that's making a lot of money in the, in the NBA? Well, I'm open for point guards too, but I'm just talking about who's available. And, and I know at this point, we still need scoring help too, and then you help with the scoring. Right. So, and I'm also, yeah. so what point guard is available? I know we have what? Well, yeah. I, hmm? Money no, wise, M- Mike Conley. Who, who else? You could trade for Mike Conley. I know it's been Mike. Yeah. Mike Conley has been mentioned, but it seems like that was a dub because it didn't happen. Uh, I know Where's Alonzo R- Ball has been mentioned. Yeah. Where's Ricky Rubio at now? Minnesota. Ricky, Ricky Rubio's in, in Minnesota. They're not trying to give him up because they, they're trying to get that reunion. They see what he did in, in Phoenix. So, mm. I mean, what are our options? I mean, I think the I think the main point guard options are probably off the table at the moment because, like, like the two I think the main point guard that was available was Chris Paul. Chris Paul's in Phoenix. Westbrook, he's in Washington. Mm-hmm. Got traded for John Wall. John Wall's in Houston. So I mean, at the moment, I don't think there's any point guard that's really available for and trade at the moment. And I don't but want Terry the, Rozier. So. I don't. Oh no! Yeah, no. I don't want Terry. I don't want Terry Rozier either. So, to me, it's like okay. If I'm going to trade for a star, it has to be somebody that I know for a fact. People are going to look at him and they're going to be like, you know what? I want to play with that dude. You know, and then that could potentially bring another star to New York. But my thing is that like, are people going to look at Buddy Hield and be like, oh, I want to play with him? Are people going to look at Zach Levine and be like, I want to play with him? You know what I'm talking about? So. I don't really know if those moves really help the Knicks long term. I just want the Knicks to be smart about it. Be like, look, if if there's a legit superstar out there and all and all of a sudden he just becomes dissatisfied with his team and he wants out. And you know for a fact, 100 percent that if you bring this guy here, he's going to attract other big name free agents to come to New York, then that's when he pulled the trigger. But you know what just, it is? It's like you can still end up moving Buddy Hill if you feel like he doesn't fit here as well because it's not like it's going to be the end all be all, right? Because everybody in the NBA is going to need a shooter. That's just one constant. Everybody in the NBA wants a three-point shooter. And if you if you have Julius Randle's contract moving out and then Buddy Hill's contract moving in, it's not like your cap is gone all of a sudden. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, you didn't take up that much more cap space is what I'm saying. So I still feel like you can make another move if need be. Right. And at the same mm-hmm. time, you still give RJ the best chance to shine when you have Buddy Hill who can shoot. Uh, you have um, Obi Toppin at the four who can possibly shoot. You just, it just opens up everything more to me. That's all I'm saying. Facts. That's all, all right. I'm saying. I mean... Maybe I'm crazy. Let me know. Let me know if I'm crazy, guys. I could be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's something to think. Of. It's something to think about. But um, sometimes the best move is no move at all. So I don't yeah, think. So you sometimes. think the best move is keeping Julius around here for the whole season? Possibly until the trade deadline, and you see what you get from him. Or maybe you, or maybe like remember, like I mentioned before, maybe you you trade him um, during the draft, and you'd be able to package him together with some other picks. And move up in the draft and get that point guard that you've been that you've been wanting. If if we don't suck and get the number one pick, but there's no guarantee because the lottery odds are different. So maybe you might need to make some strategic moves in order to get Julius Randle out of here and you know package him with um a, a, one of our picks to get a higher pick in the draft for next year. And uh, oh, well, I just feel like we're gonna stifle. I mean, I feel like but, we'll be topping at least starting off under Julius Randle could help. Uh-huh. Bring him along, but I feel like to maximize his potential, at some point, you can't have Julius Randle there because you somebody has to get most of the minutes. All right, but maybe at the trade deadline, yeah. or Julius Randle is killing, and, and a contender actually wants him. But somebody said, "Yo, we could use Julius Randle. He's averaging twenty three and whatever on the Knicks. Mm-hmm. The Knicks, the Knicks don't want him. We'll take him." You know, the only problem with Julius Randle, to be honest with you, when you watch film of him, is that when he came to the Knicks, I don't know who told him he was a point forward, right? <laughs> <Fizzdale>. <laughs> but 
When he when he gets the rebound, he needs to look for the point guard and give the point guard the ball, not bring the ball up the court and then be spinning all over the place and trying to create for himself. You know, give him the ball on the elbow where he has to make quick decisions, and that's where he'd be most effective at. So I think personally, maybe he'll change his game this year. Maybe he'll stop trying to be Lamar Odom. Maybe. And, you know? Maybe. And Kenny Payne Payne will tell him to calm down, and um, he'll be able to produce on the court, and then – we have a decision, like you said, you won't open top in the start. His value will go up, and we'll be able to treat it. His trade value will be a little bit higher than it is now. Maybe, maybe we'll see. Maybe I'm being, maybe I'm too hopeful that Obi Toppin is going to be how nice he, I think he's going to be in my head. Maybe I, and, and if that's the case, maybe we pump the brakes, but that's not how I'm thinking right now. I'm thinking Obi Toppin is going to be good. But yeah, I, think, I will say uh, that uh, Julius Randle did come to, come to me a day, and he said he's, he's been working. Uh, he got the new braids, so maybe new braids, new him. Um, <laughs> you know, Tom Thibodeau is going to push for team ball. So maybe we have the right guys who can take his game to the next level. Who knows? Right. Yeah, and just to, just to add, like, one last thing, I think the best case scenario for Knicks probably is going to be you start off with Julius Randle to start the season, and then Julius Randle actually balls out and shows other teams that, you know, he can be a, you know, he could be a good piece. To, you know, to add to a team that's, you know, going to the playoffs and potentially fighting for a title. And then you then you hope along the way Obi Toppin really develops his game to the point where it's like, OK, you, you have a legit reason to start Obi Toppin now over Randall. So that when the trade deadline comes, you know, you have no need for Randall. But teams saw how he how he performed early in the season. Mm-hmm. And then he's a, he then he becomes a viable piece to where the Knicks can actually get, you know, something good back for Randall, you know, whether yeah, it be draft I'm sure that's what or, they're thinking. Good, yeah, or a good young player, whatever the case may be. I'm sure that's what they're thinking. And if they see that um, OB is progressing the, the way they want him to progress, I'm sure they'll be even more willing to, to pull that trigger. For sure. Yeah. Facts. All right. Now. It is time for the favorite part of the show. Bruh. The bruh picks. Bruh picks are usually the worst plays of the week in basketball, but there is no basketball. So we have what we call life bruhs. Life bruhs are just stupid things that happen in everyday life, in your world. It could be something stupid that Ryan said to me. It could be something <laughs> stupid the president said. It could be anything stupid that happened that you just want to get off your chest. So, guys. Or uh, what do you know? You know, let's, let's, let's let the guests go first. The trap. All right. All right. So my bro pick is going to be Emmanuel Quickly. Bruh. Oh, bro. Uh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so so, during, me, so <laughs> during media day, they asked Emmanuel Quickly about playing with Obi Toppin in practice and uh, Mitchell Robinson and how's it going to be with playing with guys like that. So he proceeded to say, that uh, I haven't got the chance to play with them yet, but I picked the Knicks in 2K and um, <laughs> oh, and Obi Toppin and Mitchell Robinson, they're good with the lobs and dunking. They're unstoppable no. down there. <laughs> <Bruh>. <laughs> so I'm like, yo, these 19-year-olds, oh my goodness. Like, you're going to compare 2K basketball. You think that's going to translate into what's going to happen this year with the Knicks? Then we have Julius Randle. <laughs> <laughs> you, so I was just like, yo, come on, bro. I really need that. Can't believe he really said that, but he's a kid, you know. That's what he. Oh, man. Fortnite yo, I can and 2K. See it, yo. <laughs> I can already see it. Him and Knox are besties. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. We sharing bongs. Then we skipping. Why watch watching Knox? Quickly might take you a minute now. He plays defense. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a joke, but it's not a joke. I can actually. All right. Bro, man from the fifth row, my guy Ryan. All right, so now the thing about I do got a couple bro picks, two bro picks. Oh, I got two in the sh- chain. My, fr- my first bro pick goes to the New York Jets. Bro, oh, here's why. So today, as so- everybody, if you follow the NFL, you know that the Jets they haven't won a game all season. They're winless. Mm. Today against the Raiders, they had a legit shot to win the game. They had the lead late. It was like. 10 seconds left on the clock. Raiders quarterback David Carr throws a bomb to Ruggs mm. for the touchdown for the Raiders to win the game, basically at the end mm. of the game. 
And my whole thing is that if you're the Jets, why are you not playing against deep balls? Bruh. You basically had a one-on-one Pause. on the sideline. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you see my face when you said that? You see my eyebrow? Why aren't you playing against what, bro? Oh, basically, <laughs> I think they're. Uh, I, I, Ryan, I, I, I think they bitched on that I, play, I, didn't they? That that that's a bra. That's a bra. Me too. Bruh, but, um, <laughs> but but yeah, but yeah. But basically, it was one on one coverage on the sideline, and, and I'm like, come on, Jets. Like, come on. You have to be playing against a deep ball. You know they're gonna try to get the touchdown. They need a touchdown to win the game. Why are you having my man? Got this guy one on one on the sideline and have him get burned for a touchdown. Yeah, because because yeah. it's the Jets, you know they yeah, they, yeah. they what they know for the butt the butt fumble, you know. Yeah, Mark, Mark, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mark, uh, Mark Sanchez. Mm-hmm. Yeah, getting burned <laughs> deep balls. Pause. Yeah. <laughs> 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 burned from deep balls. Yo, that's two balls in the <laughs> I know. Oh, I, I did boy. it for the show. Good content. <laughs> and my next bro pick goes to. So what you to... got, Jay? I, I don't got. Oh, wait, I don't wait, got wait, 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 one more. Oh, bro. you got two. Oh, you got two. Yeah, one. Yeah, one more bro. You got two? My next bro. It goes to the people in the comments. Bruh. Because I've been seeing people in the comments. Yo, every week and, you go and, in and, the and, comments, and, man. No, you were no. a roll. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm not. The smoke. I'm, he went to smoke. I, I'm not getting that specific. Like people, it's a, it's like a group of people because I've seen this comment said repeatedly in the comment section where people are comparing 2K to actual players because people like, yo, Frank and 2K is nice, and I'm like, ah, and they're like, and they're hoping that Frank can play like how he is in 2K, and I'm like, really, you, you, gonna, you gonna really compare 2K Frank to actual Frank and hope actual Frank plays like 2K Frank? I'm like, Bruh. come on now. Like, <laughs> You, you sure you sure it's not quickly in the comments? Ah, uh, uh, it, it might be. It might be. Yeah, it, might be. <laughs> <laughs> it might be though. It might be though. Quickly in the knocks in the comments. Two K Frank nice. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. You don't get. You don't have one, Jay. Y'all don't got nothing right now. No. Oh, okay. I usually find one at the end, but nah. But it's cool. You know why? Because that was our show. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you all for listening, man. Huh? No, I was going to say, your bro could have been Alan Hahn saying, uh, <laughs> over top of playing small forward, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I gave him a pass because he said that um, he felt like Tom Thibodeau can try that, but okay. not necessarily that he won. Because <laughs> okay. I was definitely had the eyebrow like, like what? Like, I, I def- <laughs> that right. definitely caught me off guard. But I, I let him pass because he's like, no, nah, not that I want it. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I'll, I'll let you have that, Alan. Thanks. <laughs> that was our show. Thank you guys for listening. Um, the Knicks will be back December 11th. Yes, yeah, can't Knicks, wait. Yes. Knicks basketball yes. is back. Finally. Finally, finally, finally. So we get to see all our favorite players, or maybe some of them, play some ball finally. Uh, oh, you know what? Bro, picked to the schedule maker. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Set up for yeah. failure. Yeah, they set us up for failure with 65, 65 of our first games being away. <laughs> and against <laughs> and against all playoff teams, exactly. Woo. It's gonna now, be rough. It's gonna be rough. rough. Baptism mm-hmm. by fire, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, cool. You hate the burns. <laughs> Never mind. All right, that is our show. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. Um, where can they find you, D Trav? We should start with you. Then we go to us. Oh, okay. Um, this is D Trav. You can find me at uh, Mix at Night TV on YouTube, uh, also on Instagram, and you can check me out on uh, Facebook also. So like and subscribe, check me out, hit me up with a follow. Uh, once again, Jay Ellis, shout out to you and the Nick and Tom show. Thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Dope, dope. You know, it was a pleasure, my brother. 
Exactly. Mm. I appreciate you being here too, my brother. Mm. All right. And also, yeah, I'm tired. I'm, my brain checking out right now. Also, <laughs> you can find us at the Nick Time Show.com. You can see our beautiful writers writing some blogs over there. You can find us on Twitter at the KLT Show. You can find us on Instagram at the Nick Time Show. You can also find us on Facebook as well. Also, shout out to Dash Radio. What up, Dash, for housing us? First ones to believe in us. You believe in us, man. Give us a chance. Shout out to you guys. Uh, you also can listen to us on YouTube.com slash Nick Time Show. You see all the visual stuff. Definitely check that out. If you're not on YouTube already and watching us, are you dumb? What's wrong with y'all, man? Get the visuals <laughs> with the sound. Y'all crazy. Y'all lacking. Step your game. <laughs> also, you can check us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and all that noise. And yeah, that is it, man. What's up, Robert? Where can they find you? You can find my Instagram at Sir G is Chillin'. Sir G is Chillin'. That is S I R G is C H I L L I N. And for the people out there, you know, if you see any comments on IG, YouTube, or wherever, and you feel like it should be brought to my attention so, you know, I can, uh, you know, I got, you know, <laughs> let out the smoke, you know, towards those oh people, you know, you can just at me and I'll be there to, you know, read the comments and, you know, say what I need to say and then possibly go me. on and, and then possibly <laughs> go on the show and talk about it further. I'm just, I'm just right. putting that out there. Ryan, Ryan got his, Ryan got his gun cocked and loaded. He ready. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You can also find me at Jailish Ross things too. That's J E L L I S Ross. That's it. We are out of here. Peace. New York, New York, big city of dreams. I'm coming, coming, I'm coming straight out. New York, New York, big city of dreams. N N N N Y C.